What is up, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome back to Fudge Muppet. I'm Scott here with Michael and Drew. As always, this is the Elder Scrolls podcast. We hope you all had a very Merry Christmas. And today, we are talking about the Imperials. Large, like, we haven't really talked about them as, as a race yet, and really even as a culture. We've done two episodes, one on the Elysian Empire and one on the Riemann Empire. So we'll probably go a little lighter on those sections, but um, there's Let's- still plenty to talk about. Let's start with an interesting race fact about the Imperials, and that's that they didn't really seem to be much of a race before Morrowind. Mm. If you actually go and look at the playable races in Arena and Daggerfall, you can't be an Imperial. And I believe, and I may be wrong, but I'm pretty sure that they were kind of added as more of a race of their own in Adventures Redguard. Yeah, it I, became more of a thing later. Because I think that that's an important thing is, you know, Cyrodiil being the central location and the amount of history that's taken place in and around Cyrodiil. It's really hard to pinpoint any specific features or facts about Imperials that makes them Imperial except for the fact they're part of the Empire. So the idea mm-hmm. of them being important in Redguard makes sense because you've got the Imperial armies attacking Stross Mackay. Whereas when you're in their homeland... The, the rulers of Cyrodiil doesn't really have much of a bearing on the people when you've got all of these different influences, like the, the old Nedic, the Nordic, the Colovian, the Nibanese. It's like, well, what makes an imperial? Well, that's even what they call, like, some of them get called, like, they call them Cyrodiilics, but then sometimes mm-hmm. there's, like, Cyro-Nordics to sort of describe them, which is, you know, describing, like, the Nordic influence. But if we want to go into, from a law perspective... Um, the oldest thing is basically the the Nedics. So they're an a, a Nedic group of, of people that were like native to Cyrodiil at the time when the Aelids and stuff were there. But, um, and I think everyone knows that story many times over. You know, Alicia um, comes about, they rebel. And with the help of the Nords coming from the north, um, they fight off the Aelids and um, they start a new... Uh, pantheon and that's the imperial divines that basically well in an infancy sort of form because it doesn't really you got to go through all the elysian order stuff too but um from then the big distinction i guess the collective sort of term gets sort of more specific for the cyrodiilics of the time is like nibbanese because they're talking about basically the needics they're really referring to are from the nibbane um valley area which is you know all um from sort of the imperial city-ish kind of area around there and going down south but mm. later... Because the Colovians are far more Nord- uh, Nordic, yeah. aren't they? Well, cause the- they're they're, they're kind of like a mix between the two. Whereas if you're really trying to like isolate something unique about Cyrodiilic culture with the needs, the Nibbanese is... You know your best bet at doing that. Yeah. Well, we should preface too. Is so so basically the the, the Nords coming down and you know you can imagine thinking Bruma, Clovian Highlands, all these areas interbred and intermixed with the Needs, but then their culture became more dominant. So you get a lot more of Nordic culture, which influenced the Clovians. The Nibbanese are a little bit more like you know like their traditional sort of Nedic roots. But um, later on, basically, this creates this sort of fundamental divide between um, Imperials as a whole which we should throw out there, isn't really represented that well in Oblivion or, or the games in general. Mm-hmm. Um, it was more so from lore, like the uh, first pocket guide to the Empire. But the idea is that there are these sort of Clovians uh, to the West. So you're looking at places like so at Anvil through to Skin, Greg, Kovach, Coral kind of. Um, and then you get to, um, which even at the time actually extended as far as sort of Falkreath at certain times in history. Um, and then the Nibbanese, you sort of got this Chaden Hall, Imperial City, although sometimes they refer that to that as like a heartlander kind of thing. But originally sort of, you know, that area, Breville, so on, they're the Eastern culture, the sort of Nibbanese, but they all sort of get thrown into Imperials. That's one of the- and I mean, one thing about Oblivion, the game, is when you see the way Cyrodiil looks in that game, it's hard to imagine how two such distinct cultures can kind of be coexisting right next to each other. But when you kind of view it from the perspective that it was initially described as like endless jungle where, you know, you have the high, the highlands off to the west. And then in the center, you've got the grasslands where the, you know, the Nibbane Basin, where all the Nibbanese culture is. You can imagine that there's a lot of really inhospitable land between the two cultures. Yeah, well, it's like it's like functionally like the the Nibbani is also um, t- they're really the core part of of the empire, the way that it's sort of was described earlier is that the Clovians sort of 
end up being like the military kind of force, but they it often happens that there's a lot of Clovian rulers and stuff that come in, but the, the actual bulk of the empire's people are Nibbanese and there's massive um, trade culture there because basically the idea was, and the, the canon sort of, um, I guess, what was your sort of like status of all of this is kind of hard to determine because... Mm-hmm. They're kind of really trying to hard retcon the jungle out of it. But the idea was that there was basically a rice-based economy that because of this big fertile valley, you have lots, they could grow lots and lots of um, rice and rice is like one of the highest um, calorie per like square meter kind of grain that you can grow. So it can sustain a really big population. It's why China has really big population. Originally, the empire had a lot more Chinese influences in addition to sort of, you know, the Byzantine kind of or Roman kind of things going on. But um, they, because they have this big uh, trade culture and so on, they also have um, a big trade of culture itself. So lots and lots of different cults and stuff that appear during the time of um, the Elysian uh, order and so on. And, and obviously there are so many influences that get added in. So um, they end up the much more fruitier culture out of the Nibbanese mm. and the Clovian, especially aesthetically as well. They're meant to enjoy adorning themselves in different outfits with nice jewelry and things much more than the Clovians do, who are far more... I wouldn't say they're more boring, but they're more, like, um, sensible Yeah, in, in the way that they appear and, and conduct then, themselves. More of that wooden kind of folk wreath broomer energy. Yeah, it's like more of a martial kind of culture in Clovia yeah. versus a bit more mystical um, in the Nibbane region. Yeah, well, I think it's even the, I think it was the Imperial Battle Mage as a concept or idea sort of came out of Nibbanese kind of uh, culture and so on. And they have all of these under the, under the period. So it starts off, so the Elysian Empire, well, we'll, maybe it's easier if we can kind of follow along chronologically because in the same way that how the Nords aren't super like ancient Nordic anymore, you can make the same argument as to how the, the divide between um, the Nibbanese and the Clovians um, gets watered down over time as there's more, you know, and, and arguably you can make that make sense as well, even though it's not as fun to ha- like as it would be to have this really cool divide in these different kind of um, subcultures. Instead, um, you can make the sense, uh, make sense of the fact that there's been three empires, lots of consolidation of sort of um, imperial culture and stuff for, for thousands and thousands of years have happened. You know what I mean? And everything's less isolated. So, um, and obviously it's not a jungle anymore too. So that kind of changes things as well. But so we start off with the whole like Alicia, uh, Alicia thing. There's a small period of the empire where you have even um, the, the, like minotaurs as the guardians of the Elysian Empire in that kind of time. And there's some cool theories about that because of the relation to Morrow House and so on. But I think it's only a couple of hundred years before basically you, you get the rise of uh, the Elysian Order, which buy into um, the Prophet Marok's teachings and the 77, is it 77 or 71? I can't remember, inflexible doctrines um, that... Basically, there are these really strict um, commandments that he gets basically told from the the, the ghost of Alicia, of Spirit Alicia. Um, and basically, this kind of religion ends up um, co-opting the empire. And the empire essentially becomes a theocracy. Um, and whereas, you know, the religion controls the empire, essentially. It is, they're one and the same. Um, and... Uh, yeah, so, and then from that, there's thousands and thousands of years of history, but we've got it at this point, there's references to like legates and sort of like, um, in, you know, a, a imperial sort of uh, Roman sounding titles. But at the time, they don't have the same sort of um, modern legions and stuff that everyone is um, familiar with. Like that stuff doesn't come around until the Second Empire. Uh, at the time, it's, a, it's different. And you can also like arguably say that. It's like they're not this giant conquering empire. They fight against the Clovian estates and lose. And they also try and conquer High Rock and they do for a bit, but then it goes off. And like, there's a back and forth, but they never have... They never The Elysian Empire never reaches the heights of, of the others in terms of like conquered landmass or anything like that. Yeah, it more just sets the stage for what Cyrodiil would become in the mm. future when new emperors would come along um because you know the idea of having the elysian order under maruk have like it's, there's a there's a line that says something like a third of the first era which is an enormous span of time three nearly three thousand years you've got this they're really pushing this theocratic this is the religion this is the religion um and any time they're 
dealing with other cultures they're going to be pushing that as well yeah and it's like and also to clarify too actually we should probably talk about this but um we, we've mentioned it before but there's this there's a who becomes king of Skingrad, a uh, Rizlav Larik um, character, who he basically in his wars and alliances and so on, basically helps earlier in the first era separate um, the Clovian estates. So basically sort of Skingrad, Kavach, Coral and, uh, and Anvil and so on from the, uh, the empire, the Elysian empire. So the Elysian empire culturally would be very much like the Nibbanese sort of understanding of the culture. And what happens in that, separation which lasts for thousands of years um of throughout the first era is really what is responsible for the harsh divide between the two because the elysian um order and all the cults under under it and so on it, it kind of there was a political divide between the two cultures for a long time and it wasn't until we get to um the birth of Raymond cyrodiil and his eventual conquest of cyrodiil and unification of of um, the Nibbanese and the Clovians against the Akaviri. And then he also incorporates Akaviri into his own empire. So then by the time you come to the Riemann empire, you've got three influences, three really dominant influences through Akaviri, Nibbanese and Clovian. And that's when it kind of all starts being like consolidated, I guess, um, into one. And, and that, that empire gets spread super far too. I mean, basically taking over all of Tamriel, except for Morrowind, yeah, and Black Marsh, I would argue. And, yeah, but, but yeah, but like, officially, re, re, like officially, everything except Morrowind, mm -hmm. and obviously sp spreading the Divine's Imperial cult kind of religion all around the place as well. It just further spreads their own culture, but at the same time, it does allow other elements of other cultures to have all these micro influences as well. Yeah. Yeah. Like you've got, and also just in terms of economics, like the Imperials are a very merchant centric kind of race and culture. And so obviously you can imagine if you're living even far away from other provinces, like in the Imperial city, you've got goods coming in from elsewhere, from Morrowind, like from all over the place. It, yeah. it tends to produce quite the melting pot. Well, to start with, that's kind of like, I guess, like why they get called the sort of um, you know, the most cosmopolitan race. But like my main argument would be is it's it's cosmopolitan practically for practical reasons, not for this sort of, I don't really think it's like an idealistic attempt because you don't really see the idealistic like, oh, we want to like introduce or like they go to other country, um, other nations and so on. And then they just conquer them and then colonize these areas. They're not, and they take the good parts, like the flavor and stuff, but they're not really interested in like, um, individual sort of sovereignty of areas i guess and then they don't want them to keep more culture than they have to you know because you see mm -hmm. increased imperialization in morrowind in skyrim um you know obviously if you play red guard adventures it's it's not fun being taken over by the empire but um you know they i i see them as a really practical it's even it's weird to say race because really the imperial race and the culture that it is the empire is kind of indistinguishable um but they are really uh, practical in terms of, you know, the, the mm -hmm. trade and the, and the stuff that you can gain. From I, I suppose if you wanted to look at them as a race and try and make them more unique, you can just look to the games and see what kind of um, bonuses they've been given and how they've been represented. And a lot of the time it is as that kind of smooth talking, mm -hmm. diplomatic, silver tongue, you know, bonuses to speech and barter and so on. Interestingly... It, I, it does question whether or not that's biological because they've known they've been known to be these shrewd diplomats, right? But if you go look at the bonuses in Skyrim, uh, you get a plus 10 to restoration and then a plus 5 to block destruction, enchanting, heavy armor, and one-handed, but they don't actually have... You'd mm. think they would have a plus 10 to speech or a plus 5 to speech. And I, I wonder if... And this is just a theory, right? I wonder if that could be because you're in Skyrim as an Imperial... And especially with the whole crumbling empire mm. theme in the fourth era, perhaps you don't have the sway. Perhaps that sway was never biological. Yeah. Because imagine in the other games when the empire is at the height of its power, it's kind of like ruling over, over other provinces that you're experiencing the game in. As an imperial, perhaps you're a little bit more charismatic for other reasons than your charisma, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Like a little bit more persuasive because, hey, I've got the biggest army in all of Tamriel and we're kind of ruling your province. So, you know, I think my idea is pretty good, isn't it? Whereas in Skyrim, they've, they've lost that. I will say they do still have the voice of the emperor power, which kind of gives that pacifying 
calming effect. I suppose that's the only nod to their... Yeah. But it's not even a speech thing. It's a power. On the terms of like... Sorry, were you going to... No, well, I was just going to say, it's like you really can't... Um, you can't define Imperials as a race. Like, you know, as the name suggests, you're only really calling them after their rulers and after their culture. So like, it, you know, if you were trying to give them racial bonuses, it'd be like, well, how do you give like a one of the original Nedic inhabitants racial bonuses? Like, you know, with Bretons, you've got the elven aspects. With the Nords, you've got the kind of like the magical at more and breath breathed onto the throat of the world kind of aspect. But I think anything to do with speech craft can only really be a part of the, 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 it's just kind of a metaphor for the fact that the empire uses their diplomacy in order to spread their wings over the rest of Tamriel. Uh, arguably though, in terms of like about it being a race, I would say that like in our real, um, in our real world, for example, um, maybe ethnicity is, um, rather a more accurate sort of term but you could say for example like people like english people today are you know the creation of like you know celts and saxons of different things if you were to imagine just for sake of like you know analogy like putting instead of nibbanese you've got celts and then saxons is, you can mm -hmm. take place clovians but that, that combination creates a unique mix of genetics which exists for thousands of years which then becomes the um becomes the the modern thing so you could go like the imperials or, or the english like it's do you know what I mean? Like, no, I I, I do follow. I, I mean, because and I guess the one Bretons I was, too are a creation yeah. of a, a race creation from an intermix mixture. You know what I mean? Mm. That then I become guess, like, isolated themselves. And... Yeah, it, but what is it that gives them the speech craft? Like, I'm I'm kind of taking Drew's side here a little bit, just playing devil's advocate for a second. What Eugenics. Is it? <laughs> it's the <laughs> that, but that, it, yeah, but that's that's kind of what I'm saying. Like, are you saying that only those with the most Silver tongues survived. Well, they... The most charismatic persuasive <laughs> yeah. survived and passed. But yeah. then it wouldn't be because that tends to be the top echelons of society who become the the famous merchants and yeah. The, I'm not so the much famous... kings. And stuff. Yeah, yeah, like all the kings and merchants and royalty and all that that are successful because of their silver tongues. That's not what the common class who make up the bulk of. But the, I'm not so much arguing for like, like necessarily their powers because all powers and stuff in the games no, too the, can the be bonus. or the bonuses. Bonus. They can be like you know, okay. red guards shouldn't have a plus five to alteration. Well, in my opinion, one thing or I'll argue, okay, like, okay. but okay. I, I was just. Um, Okay, no, you go where I forgot well, what I was saying. Go. Okay, well, sorry. <laughs> uh, I mean, so. it, obviously, we know it's not a one-to-one -one comparison, but even mm. just using in England as an example, you could very well make the argument that if you compare the Celts to the Nibbanese and then the um, the Saxons to the Colovians, which kind of makes sense, you still very much do have the Anglo-Saxon culture just completely wipe out the Celtic culture, except for in small corners of the country. So, you know, if you're in Wales or if you're in Cornwall, then you still have a lot of your roots. Whereas yeah. if you're mainland England, you're much more likely to be kind of the Germanic aspects rather than the French or the Celtic. But arguably, if we throw that again, couldn't you actually say that that's kind of what's happened, that Colovian culture is the dominant and mm -hmm. has kind of wiped out all of the unique sort of old Nibbanese or Celtic in this analogy kind Fair. of things and then the Clovians have kind of become the dominant culture but so the I guess that would explain why there's no kind of magical aspect to Imperials as a race because if you have the Nibbanese that was my concern was that if you have Nib Nibbanese influence on the race you would expect to see some 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 kind of magical resistance or an ability to the destruction magic or something that makes you a battle mage well, they've got plus 10 restoration. Oh, yeah, so rest right. well, restoration. <laughs> but I don't know what that, if that means anything. I think they're just all. trying they just to, needed like... to balance skills yeah. and, and stuff. No, but it, it is interesting because we know that, like, Breton's magical resistance, it's innate. Mm. It's not a cultural thing. You know, like, um, you know, Khajiit being good at, at you know, feline related things makes sense because of their biology, because, you know, they're like cat folk. Yeah. So, what do Imperials have? Yeah, mm -hmm. nothing really, I, I guess. But I don't know <laughs> if the really like native needs or something necessarily would have either. They don't yeah, have to. But, just... but yeah, also the other thing to throw in there too with the Clovian sort of saying becoming dominant thing, also the increasing um, each empire progressively, you could argue, became more Nordic. Really with Tiber Septon a, a big part of it too. Um, but um, that Nordic influence and part of the reasons I guess they called like Syro Nords and stuff a lot of the time now you would argue there's a lot more Nordic intermixture as well at the end of the day gameplay buffs and bonuses like 
we've we've talked about this before, but things with races are never going to be properly reflected in gameplay terms because you you can't be because you can't mm -hmm. really like math out like oh I'm like you know ancestry DNA seventeen percent Nord. 10% Breton, 5% Dunma. Like, you can't really, like, mix that all in. It's got to be, like, pick one binary sort of race. And, and if I know you were to do it properly, you'd probably have some races that are far more overpowered than others, too. Do you know, this isn't an ES, this isn't an ES6 idea episode, but it would, I would, you know how they're really against um, adding more races, which I agree with. I kind of think 10 playable races is more than enough, but they could do kind of what they do in, like, some, you know, Baldur's Gate or, like, D&D um, &D sort of, system kind of games um doing sub races so for example if you can be imperial or you but you can pick a sub race being like nibbanese or clovian and that makes some minor changes to some of the abilities and stats and stuff like that that you get but you know they could even do that expand that kind of cool idea to um a few of the other kind of races like even if it was things like you know nord or it's like eastern or western skyrim mm -hmm. or like or, or dunmer even if there was like house thing or something underneath or yeah, from area like an Ashlander perhaps. yeah or, yeah and then so having like, like crowns versus forebears with the red guards can can yeah quite heavily affect and the, the changes wouldn't be as large as they the changes between the races are but just a variation on on you know mm -hmm. the imperial or the whatever it could just be a cool fun extra role playing role playing and also gameplay kind of things to help you sort of mm -hmm navigate like what like you know more sp make a more specific build if you want to be an imperial battle mage then maybe imperial nibbanese or something mm. is better to go yeah, yeah. I, I, I suppose another thing about imperials which definitely you could say is derived from just culture is that they are known to be in addition to successful merchants and silver tanks they're quite well educated and highly organized like when you look at the other races of of men in the elder scrolls universe you know the nords are very like um more barbaric and they'll rush in and and you know seize victory with courage and and strength whereas the imperial style is very much like about organization and diligent practice and preparation so that you win and kind of like thinking ahead yeah i think like you could argue some of it actually came from the akaviri because the akaviri you know pretty seem pretty successful like well they fail both times but they, they are they're a formidable army they've been a it was threat. ambitious ambitious but um because the idea is that the Imperial Legion that, you know, today started around the kind of Riemann times and it really came about from um, a lot of Akaviri tactics and practices and so on. And obviously you have the, the Dragon Guard and then later Blades and that Akaviri influence, which is far more specific. But even for the Legion as a whole, a lot of the formalization of the sort of Ruby ranks or whatever came about. Like, Riemann really is one of the... And he's also worshipped someone as a, as a culture hero god kind of thing. But he really is, I guess, I would say, the birth of the modern empire in the way that we understand it now. Because even things like the whole, like, the rites of the dragon fires and stuff like that are making that a formal sort of process and, and stuff like... Uh, and, you know, obviously the cre formation of the legions are sort of as they are um, today and so on. And, and once the Colobian kings kind of had their their sovereignty and their own power the only way you were ever going to unify Cyrodiil let alone Tamriel was to have an incredibly powerful leader which mm. Riemann proved himself to be yeah absolutely but yeah so I, I guess that's how we can understand it's like I said it's not as fun as Nivenese Clovian being heaps diverse and so on mm. but it mm -hmm. does make sense <clears throat> when you consider that even mm -hmm. Riemann um came about um you know, a couple hundred years before the end of the first era. And then, so you're looking at like, you know, a nearly, no, over a thousand, maybe nearly 2000 years up to now, you know, so mm -hmm. it's a long time. Especially when you remove the jungle as well, it'll be a much more unified province. Mm. They, they've moved, they've removed a lot of the aesthetic cool stuff as well, like around the Imperial City. I know the pocket guide to the empire, first edition Cyrodiil has some really cool quotes, which I mean, I'm happy to read. Uh, there's a, talking about the imperial city specifically it says from the shore it is hard to tell what is city and what is palace for it all rises from the islands of the lake towards the sky in a stretch of gold whole neighborhoods rest on jeweled bridges that connect the islands together gondolas and river ships sail along the watery avenues of its flooded lower dwellings moth priests walk by in a cloud of ancestors house guards hold exceptionally long dai katanas crossed at intersections adorned with ribbons and dragon 
flags and the newly arrived Western Legionnaires sweat in the humid air. The river mouth is tainted red from the tinmy soil of the shore and river dragons rust their hides in its waters. Along the, across the lake, the Imperial city continues merging into the villages of the Southern Red River and ruins left from the interregnum. Like that sounds way, way cool. I <laughs> All I think of is like, it's like, it's like Todd Howard and, and he's like, oh, c- could we have a game set in Cyrodiil? It's like, oh, we have Cyrodiil at home. And it's like, <laughs> Cyrodiil at home's oblivion. <laughs> that, but that's like, oh. Because it, it really does, that, that description really paints the kind of alien frontier that they came to this central land. They found this obscure race of bird people. They built these this grand city around this tower that was done in the in the aspect of the greatest tower the ur tower the adamantine tower and you can imagine it kind of becoming the center ground for cosmopolitan attitudes of a bunch of different cultures that were forced together you know you these risen slaves this nordic influence the aliens the and everything else that comes along afterwards um but when you remove a lot of the kind of frontier elements of it and you just kind of dumb it down to be you know middle earth or something like that um then yeah i'll see you kind of lose it <laughs> i'll see if i can find it um again but so i've talked about it before there's tamriel rebuilt which is really the projects talking about rebuilding morrowind and so on but more broadly they've they've kind of they're kind of grouped and shared resources and stuff and um but there's a project called project tamriel which you know they've done parts of skyrim and so on but they're doing parts of cyrodiil and there's some really cool they'll show like pictures of um you know anvil and so on and little bits of work and so on but i saw a uh, a map mapping out the imperial city and it's just like there's so many islands in between and it's all connecting with all these different districts but all of that ring around the side of the lake is also filled with forts and towns and cities and and you know plantations and stuff because it's like this giant expanding metropolis it's the imperial city it's supposed to be the you know what you would imagine is the most populous most central place in all of tamriel it's kind of crazy to imagine that it's just like a little ring yeah in the middle I mean, I, of the town. It, yeah, because obviously it is the limitations, but it, it does sound really cool. And like, you know, thinking back to kind of stories about London back in medieval times where you've got Tower Bridge and there's so the, the it's so populous that you've got houses ri- like lining the, the bridges, mm. you know, so people are just living in these tiny shanties where really it shouldn't be happening. And it adds so much more kind of culture and life to the city. But obviously Oblivion was never really going to manage that. Yeah, it, it, it's... Uh is unfortunate but there's been some cool to to, uh eso's credit so if we get over the whole jungle thing the jungles it's just not happening it's gone but um they they do have some cool um sort of exploration of the um imperial legions and imperial culture and stuff like even in the blackwood dlc at the moment like because they're basically like leowen is sort of because, you know, you've got the fall apart of the Riemann Empire and you've got the Three Banners War, so you've got the Ebonheart Pact and Aldmeri Dominion. They're all fighting over the Imperial City and that's like a battleground almost. But you've got certain areas of former Cyrodiil um, that are, you know, all right. And you've got um, the Countess of Leowen and so on. She's sort of harboring the uh, Elder Council, the remaining members of the Elder Council and stuff. And and you, even in their clothing and stuff, there is some there is a increased sort of i would say like more it looks more exotic and i guess it's kind of probably just more byzantine or something but compared to like oblivion which is really fairly run-of-the-mill sort Mm of medieval kind of look for the most part um yeah yeah i mean it's it's unfair to say that they didn't distinguish between um the people and the cities but the difference between leowin and a colovian city is not nearly as drastic as you'd like if if it was more attentive to the law yeah yeah, Oblivion as a whole, I'd say, even in execution, feels very um, like one size fits all, like kind mm-hmm. of like that. There, there's a major's guild and a fighters guild in every single city. The city changes in terms of like quests and like what it looks like, but all, a lot of the people act. You know what I mean? There's no large cultural differences and stuff, and but you you get obviously they threw in like the racial differences. Like there, there is the idea that with the Nibbanese, naturally, you would imagine because they are a more um, diverse sort of culture, even in terms of like cults and practices and stuff like that, um, that they adopt a lot of the um, uh, Eastern influences and stuff, even things that come from like Morrowind or Black Marsh or, mm-hmm. or, or other sort of things like that. Um, but yeah, all their cool like tattoos. You go back and look at the concept art and stuff and there's like a, they're Michael Kirkbride stuff and there's one of, um, I'll probably put it up, but there's like a, 
it's like a Clovian king or something with a bodyguard from Rehard, and it's like this sort of like really bloat max sort of red guard muscled guy who's like in the in fat guy in the back with like a big mace and so on and it just looks so cool and you've got he's got like that uh the clothing king's got that like gladiatorial kind of mm. style helmet and then you see like a nibbanese one it's the guy with the staff and it's sort of got like these tattoos and so on actually you know what i will say in in dragon in skyrim some of the war paints kind of look like there could be cool tattoo designs but like um like different sort of imperialish sort of looking war paints that are very like intricate and so on and it's sometimes what i imagine i know in tamriel rebuilt for morrowind they add like i remember even in old old ebonheart just like walking into the imperial um cult area and you ah uh, sorry the temple and you go in and there's a woman and she's kind of got like this she's bald but she's got like this kind of imperial kind of dragon kind of tattoo and stuff and it, it's cool it's what you imagine it's also one of the things too that in terms of the history of the games dragons in elder scrolls history have generally been really highly associated with an empire thing like there's even mentioned that like the rust dragons which can also be interpreted as like lizards but there was even i'm pretty sure even there's dragon riders and stuff in some of the older lore or mm. the set about but you know in their symbol as a dragon and you know akatosh and all of that the dragon sort of thing has really been an imperial um you know it, and there was a dragon with um tiber septum when he took over um hammerfell you know uh, nephalalagus and the idea is that dragons were kind of around skyrim really you know but rare and fewer of them but what's it call it Skyrim introduced the whole Dragon Wars thing and all the dragons are gone and now they're coming back and stuff like mm. that you know I mean like the, the way you mentioned kind of the imperial influence and Morrowind that that's an important part of the kind of colonial attitude of the empire is that generally speaking when you try to expand into another province or continent or country or whatever else you tend to get absorbed by their culture not the other way around mm. if you try to cling on too tightly to your own you just become you know, like a stronghold in somebody else's territory um, mm. and you're just, you just fight against them. You know, like you, you can compare that to say the Romans going to Britain. There, there was no hope they'd ever truly make it a part of their empire. So instead they just became British, the ones who yeah. went. It's, it's cool. Like that's one thing I really love about uh, like Morrowind and even its dynamics of, of the, you know, the factions and stuff and how it's executed in that game. But even having House Lalu there, mm -hmm. you know, with Duke Vadim Dren, like taking on an Imperial title as well and so on. And you there and they're benefiting from, you know, assisting Imperialization and like better, like that kind of dynamics really um, cool. But uh, yeah. I mean, that's that's what the Empire does. They, they try and make it as beneficial as possible to assimilate to their culture so that... Yeah. So that you do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because it, that it's a really... But... To be fair, too, we should actually, looking at, at Morrowind as an example, because out of the mainline games, not really talking about Daggerfall era and prior, but out of the more modern um, 21st century Elder Scrolls games, um, the uh, out of those, every single area that we've been to, so Skyrim and Cyrodiil have been like imperialized or imperial native and so on, except Morrowind. And mm -hmm. Morrowind even in itself was um, only incorporated into the empire under favorable terms of the armistice and so on um and what you do see with the the empire's attack on hammerfell and so on that really wasn't pleasant and they even got favorable terms because they had this big sort of crown rebellion like led by Aeneas cyrus and so on but like you don't know how necessarily bad a lot of the empire is for when they're attacking a place that's they're just leveling well i mean we do when we, we look at tiber septum who just like leveled the somerset isles but with um the numidium you do hear things from different characters like i think i've talked about before the dark elf in the um the murder house party quest yeah. in the dark brotherhood she talks about how bad the imperials were in morrowind and how mm. you know she's seen all these atrocities and how disgusting they yeah. were and how she hates hates the empire because of it yeah and you can imagine they're like that all over the place yeah absolutely I mean, it's there, and like anything, there's so many of them that there'd be instances of bravery and heroic deeds as well as really, really bad mm. stuff and atrocities. The, this is one aspect where there's a lot of potential for Elder Scrolls VI, if it's set in Hammerfell, to see a really different portrayal of the Imperials. Because obviously the Imperials have a long history with Hammerfell and with the crowns. And to, to see a cross between the Imperial... Sorry, Forebears, yeah. yeah. Um, to see... Um, the crossover between imperial culture and the desert and how, you know, 
strongly attached to their religion and their beliefs the red guards were even before the forebears came became kind of imperialized you and, could do that a lot more justice than cyrodiil or skyrim and they've also got like real like since they're basically look cyrodiil like even despite the like sort of chinese and byzantine kind of things that have really been there for the empire like they've really leaned into like roman because like mm. roman's the most sort of you know, it's most popular in culture. It's very easy to look at and like understand it. They should actually, they could absolutely lean into it and look at like um, the Roman conquests of the, you know, the Middle East and all into Egypt and stuff and have a lot of that kind of, mm-hmm. you know, vibe. It'd be interesting. Like, I mean, funnily enough, the armor that they're wearing in Skyrim probably fits like some desert campaign, some sort of like like leathery yeah. sort of like light, mm-hmm. cool kind of stuff. They should have had some sort of rugged up kind of like Romans in in, you know, England kind of vibe instead of the other mm-hmm. way around. But yeah, so the, the armor fits mm. a lighter. I just hope the crowns are incredibly traditional mm. and mm. and like Yakut and God oriented in Elder Scrolls 6. Because if they do what they did with Skyrim and they just water it down, to, because they, they can already do that with the Four Bears. They're going to be the watered down, you know, the watered down Red Guard <sighs> culture. And you need that conflict. But the thing is, yeah. too, the reason I would, I would actually be like, there, there could be, there's a good chance they even might, from a design perspective, like, go in, just like, let's make Hammerfell Hammerfell. Just because, remember, that this is what would be really cool, is um, for a 21st century Elder Scrolls game, first time that you were in a province that is not ruled by the Empire. The Empire are not the rulers of this place. So, the you're dealing with purely just the, the native, the crowns and forebears there, um, and their sort of political situation. And, you know, there could be cool stuff with, you know, You'll have like imperial sympathizers who want to come, you know, be part of the empire again and, and stuff like that. And, and the crowns who are really happy you don't, you know. In a weird way, that makes me expect it to be more of a high rock game because I'm like, hmm, Bethesda doing something they've never done before. <laughs> nah. <laughs> yeah. That, they'll, they'll, they'll want the empire to be in charge. I mean, high rock is very safe not. as a fantasy game. To oh, set it's so safe. Rock. But yeah. why my, my biggest thing to them to, to say to that too is just like you don't need safe. You are mm-hmm. like the biggest open world RPG. Mm-hmm. Ever. Everyone's gonna buy Skyrim two set in Hammerfell. Like mm-hmm. no one's not just. Yeah, yeah. You could do whatever you want. You could set it wherever you like, and they will. I, you know. I, I mean, ideally, it would be set in both provinces, and 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 I don't just mean like Iliac Bay. Like you can go into half of each or something like that. I mean like proper mm. full on two province game. I did. I did. Like that, it is a cool idea too. But like one thing, I, I sort of changed my mind in in recent months on that. In that, I would rather them do the, a single province and nail it really, really well, and apply scale. So the same scale that they would use to one versus high rock, instead go up it, like make every sort of city a Novigrad kind of thing. Instead of because if they have to spread their resources, like when people go like, oh, I want it everywhere Tamriel kind of game, you're gonna get ESO. Or like in terms of its execution of cities and stuff. And- oh, don't don't get me wrong. I fully understand yeah. that. Like we've we've said that before. It's always better to do one thing right than two things, you know, half right. And but if 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 in an ideal world, if it was all just hundred percent maxed out in terms of mm-hmm. how good it is, I think we'd all rather both. It's just more game. Yeah. Oh, I just like I feel like you could every second you put high rock in you could just punch the 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 like punch the um the the scale like ridiculously like go bigger and bigger make it feel big like every city like although yeah it people. would be it would be a really good contrast to Skyrim you wouldn't be calling it Skyrim two it'd be more like yeah. hot Skyrim <laughs> yeah <You> know, so- <laughs> but dude so- even even Hammerfell the other thing too Hammerfell has crowns and forebears you can have any sort of imperial extra sort of sto- um, storyline stuff there but the other thing is Orsinium as well. Mm. Um, because that's mm. in Hammerfell now, so you'd have. There's just a lot of like variety that's already there. That you and can... a big chunk of it is still kind of somewhat in Old Mary Dominion hands. And yeah, be well, their it's influence hard... on it, even though it's more modern history. Imagine, imagine the scale of Orsinium actually being kind of like the Falma territory in the Forgotten Forgotten Vale, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Mm. Like imagine all that area though was covered in Falma. So you know the small Falma camps. Yeah. Imagine they just like covered kind of way more and then it was just this huge orcish kingdom camp yeah, thing. They, like that would be scale to the map. Yeah, they have mm. so much so much potential. I think Hammerfell's an awesome setting for it. Plus it's it's the best chance we've got for something a little bit more interesting. Um, rather than like High Rock sounds so plain and now that e- now they've got ESO that have like doubled down on like, yeah, High Rock's the plain medieval place. It's gonna look 
plain and medieval. Do you know well, what I mean? And we, we have to give them credit because um, it's very easy to go into it with a kind of the lens of, oh, you know, if they make it as good as Skyrim, maybe slightly bigger. So, theoretically, that it should be nothing like Skyrim in terms of scale. We can afford to be very ambitious when it comes to that. <laughs> D- um, and if they years, don't deliver. Yeah, exactly. Like so much, so much growth of... Um, mm technology has happened in that time like it's it's just crazy even having to even even growth of the business right like they have way more resources and team members and yeah absolutely there's no excuse yeah Mm -hmm. but back to we're talking about yeah yeah Yeah. everyone likes a fun little es6 uh side Mm -hmm. side show but um yeah so back to back back to the imperials um i reckon we can kind of move forward and kind of so, like we sort of established, Riemann Empire really brings in the sort of kind of culture that you understand Imperials today. I would say that the Elysian Empire would probably feel like Nedic far more than anything else and far more traditional. Like even, you know, their religion was almost completely different. Like the divines sort of, uh, those eight divines that Elysia made exist underneath this sort of the one in their Elysian order for so long and they had lots of different weird cults of like vegetarianism and all, all kinds of stuff that, that went on. Um, apparently that was actually a big thing. A bit, a lot of the vegetarian sort of cults and stuff, um, drove the need for trade and so on to import different foods and, and stuff. Like they had all these requirements with husbandry really? and stuff, the cult. Yeah. It's in the first pocket guide uh, right, thing. Okay. But anyway, um, so you come to Riemann, Riemann sort of creates the empire that you have today. And then you have the, you know, he gets assassinated by the monarch Tong, the Elysian order, uh, not the Elysian order, sorry, the Akaviri potentates, uh, run the whole show for a little bit longer. And then even then, funnily enough, like the Akaviri Potentate run empire lasts longer than the Riemann run Riemann empire did, mm-hmm. you know? So they also introduce things like um, the the guild charter acts and so on. So, you know, Mages Guild, Fighters Guild, all of these things, you know, Fighters Guild even the, is was called the Safim, I think it was. Um, it was an Akaviri only sort it of organization like to start with. Mm-hmm. But they, anyway, they, so they, they, that's when you get the guilds, um, implemented and the guild also applies to like everything to like you know from like prostitution to lawyers to obviously the fighters guild and stuff that we know but it covers a lot of things um and then you get that whole fall there's the whole fall and you have the events of eso and so on and, and you see fragments of the imperial like culture and empire still like lives on and so on like in leowen and you have the elder council living there but then there's like you know certain what functionally become kings of their own areas of like Anvil and so on, like whatever. And the rest is kind of like fought over and there's all the like battle stuff and so on. But then we get to past the interregnum and you get to where Tiber Septim, the conventional story is that, you know, Tiber Septim is a great Nordic hero. Well, he wasn't called Tiber Septim then, it's Talos or so on, um, supporting General Kulakane, um, uh, who was a Clovian king of Falkreath, who was unifying the Clovian estates and, and wanting to unify Skyrim and so on. And he, he sort of had the ambition to rebuild the empire. And that's why he kind of gets called Emperor Zero. But he was assassinated by a High Rock Nightblade. Um, and then Tiber Septim took up the reins. He became emperor. And he basically conquered the whole show with the Numidium. Um, and then you get the start of the Third Empire, really. Um and there's a glorious reign under Tiber Septim till he dies. It's very convenient that Kula Kane is assassinated, obviously. Yes, exactly. But- oh, and that also slit his uh, Tiber Septim's throat, so he couldn't mm-hmm. use the the thumb anymore. Not because Ismir Wolfarth had disappeared, <laughs> <laughs> um, but basically. But then you then you get to the start of the Third Empire, and actually Tiber Septim's grandson um, Pelagius the First is the next emperor, and he gets killed by the Dark Brotherhood. Um, and then it goes over to, uh, Kintyra, who's actually, uh, Tiber Septim's niece. So the rest of the entire Septim line does not directly descend from Tiber Septim. They directly descend from Agnarith, who is Tiber Septim's brother, who then goes to Kintyra and then it goes on. So it's a bit of a sham, the whole thing, because you really read this kind of thing of like Martin Septon's talking about, you know, oh, my ancestor, my ancestor, my ancestors kind of thing. And then it's like, oh, Tiber Septon, it's like, you lit, none of you spawned from his balls. None of you. (laughs) Like in literally none of the Septon empires. And there's a lot of um, controversy and stuff you, you have with, you know, later succession wars and the War of the Red Diamond. Their third era ebbs and flows in ter- terms of like turbulent periods. But just when Uriel Septum gets in, it's actually one of the more peaceful periods that you ever get. So most of the games arena through 
um, to, more, uh, to Oblivion, Uriel Septim's being the ruler. Um, though there are big upsets. He gets handed a peaceful empire, but then obviously he, you know, gets replaced by Jagar Tharn, and then you've got um, the Oblivion Crisis and, and all of those things going on. It's all downhill from there. But that's really is the third the third era culture of Morrowind. It's a, it's probably it's third empire is probably a really way to, good way to look at the empire as it's known by the rest of the world because it's what we have the most like sample of. Like you know, Morrowind is set in an imperial controlled. Um, it's imperial controlled and it has been for you know the four hundred and whatever years it is. Um, so you know, four centuries of him imperial rule. Skyrim's been imperial ruled for what six hundred? Well. Yeah, 600 years since that point, but it has been previously as well. But uh, yeah, so Imperials are the Empire. <laughs> <laughs> they are the Empire. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so and that's and then we get to the Empire of today, which sucks. <laughs> yeah, the Mu <laughs> Dynasty is... isn't quite as prolific as yeah, the that... Septim one, you could say. Well, Titus made the first sounds all right. When mm. when you when you read about what he did, he at least sounded somewhat accomplished in in his life. Mm. You know, he 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 was probably a bit of a chad compared to Titus Mead the second. Yeah, it's it's interesting too because like this is the first time the empire has no holy prestige. So with Alicia, you've got like you know that's the whole Saint Alicia, slave queen, all of that kind of stuff. The divine gods chose her, helped her, starts the covenant, amulet of kings, all that. When Reman has his whole story of that, he was literally born because a king made love with Cyrodiil like Alicia manifests as Cyrodiil and then basically sort of he's born from a hill I mean that's at least the story that's sort of told in his kind of you know um origin story and then he so then he becomes you know he's a dragonborn king and there's these sort of divine kind of Reman kings and stuff uh emperors sorry then you have Tiber Septim and so on and then it's another dragon blood sort of story um but then you come across to uh, the Mead and it's literally, it just is very much like I'm Titus Mead and I took advantage and I, I you know, the, won To be fair the to the Mead dynasty, it kind of suffers the same way the whole fourth era suffers is that you've got a big stretch of time with no real information of what's going on during it. Mm-hmm. You know, but between Titus Mead the first and Titus Mead the second, there's 150 years. Um, there are supposedly other rulers in between that we don't really know about. Obviously, the Oblivion Crisis puts him in a bad, puts Cyrodiil in a bad position, even when Titus Mead does claim the throne. But you, you, you would think that within two hundred years, you'd kind of get things under control again and not be quite so frail when the Old Merry Dominion come come knocking. Yeah, well, I mean, that's the thing too. It's like the Old Merry Dominion weren't even a thing at the exact time they were kind of created just after. So what is it? So mm-hmm. Old Merry Dominion is recreated after Eleanor and Valor would proclaim a union in. The uh, year twenty nine, mm-hmm. and Titus Mead became fresh emperor year seventeen. So you know he's got a, he's had a bit of time, like twelve or something years. Um, but then all of a sudden the album you know kicks them out, and Could, then they yeah. it always becomes so hard to to justify certain things because it seems like the old Mary Dominion is is have, they've got a plan in action, they're picking up the pace. I can't remember the exact year, but the difference between bringing. Valenwood un- into the fold and elsewhere is is a long time that you can't really justify, um, and the same kind of applies to the Mead dynasty, kind of setting things to, up. To throw them a bone, the one thing I could say with that there's the Knight of Green Fire U forty two, which is like the ultimate dissidents, like fled from Sent- Sentinel from the Thalmor and so on um, into Sentinel, and then they they all like get killed by Thalmor chasing them or something like that. Right, that mm-hmm. whole sort of thing there kind of implies that there's probably a big transition period in mm-hmm. even after the establishment of the Aldmeri Dominion lots of dissidents and probably rebellion it probably takes a bit of time for the Somerset to, to the Aldmeri Dominion to truly get control of its territory so you could argue but, that the empire really has no excuses for being so much weaker yeah yeah t- probably true yeah <laughs> I mean I guess the only thing I guess they start off they get when when Titus Mead takes control you pro- he probably has similar kind of rebellious kind of things going on that might not be written about because he had to fight a whole storm crown interregnum thing t- to get it in the first place then he needs everyone to accept him truly and not just him in him in Cyrodiil they've got he's got to get Skyrim and Hyrock mm-hmm. and all of the territory sort of on board um 
So he could have a similar situation, but yeah, still there's like an extra hundred years after that. It's it's a long it's a long ass time. Like yeah, I feel like they should have done a little better, but yeah, I I don't think they're um I I, I like the sort of empire crumbling arc. I think it's more interesting mm-hmm. for the series. Yeah, uh, I'm done with the empire. <laughs> yeah, they're they're just, just getting a bit stale. It would just be so cool to see anything else, really. Yeah. So you're yeah. saying you want the old Mary Dominion to conquer Tamriel? That's no, I'm saying that uh, if they were more powerful than they are now in the next game, it could be quite interesting. Mm. No, fair. You know? Mm. Yeah. I mean, arguably, like, Season on Ending would be really cool um, as a state to exist while playing The Elder Scrolls VI, where you hear about the Civil War still happening. But in the same vein, I think it would also be really cool if the Stormcloaks just won. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because, because it, it just it just messes it's things the more up with the empire so much. Yeah. I, I can see unification of like your character being essential in the unification of the crowns and forebears, being very important to a conflict with the the Falmor, the Aldmeri Dominion in Elder Scrolls Six. I can see that being a thing. That, that could be an interesting. I mean, look, it would force people into like obviously against the Thalmor kind of thing. It'd be cool if you could probably help the Thalmor even from a role playing perspective. I agree, but I don't think it will happen. No, but yeah, but what's but... more likely to happen there is it could be cool is if we between the crowns and the forebears there are really um like tough decisions you have to make to get an alliance and so on and and things that you have to do t- because the alliance is so important to fight the Armored Dominion or something like mm-hmm. that. Almost like it not being the default. Yeah. Like, it's kind of like most players pick one, but then it's like, you know, I can imagine the YouTube video in my head. It's like how to ally them for like the secret ending. Yeah, the, yeah. The best ending possible. Real, um, to, to pull this back on course, we should start talking about Imperials more. But there is, there's a lot of, this empire is huge. You got the Legion, you've got all of this trade and, and economy and, you know, colonies everywhere, all that kind of stuff going on. And what naturally comes with such a high civilization point is a lot of institutions. We kind of like talked about the guilds and so on. Um, we should also talk, just briefly mention at the very least that that there is quite a bureaucracy to it. And that's why the, arguably like a lot of them are involved in this and, and diplomacy and so on um, with the Elder Council. And there's been arguments that uh, if you look throughout the Third Era, for example, the, the Elder Council holds a lot of power. Um, and a lot of the time, mm-hmm. the Empire just becomes a little bit... Of, the Emperor is sometimes a bit of a puppet. But then certain, um, you know, enterprising Emperors have wrestled more control from them using the blades and, and stuff like that. Um, but sh- There's no blades now to help them. And I mean, yeah. if you look in Skyrim, you can see with Mortier assassinating the Emperor and yeah. you know, his ties with the Elder Council. It seems like if they're not happy with the Emperor... And they have, you know, perhaps come together, you know, in the council and said, you know what, we should instill this person as a leader instead. Maybe they do, you know, pull the strings far more than people think and kind of change the whole course of Tamrielic history. They're the, um, they're the... The Illuminati. Yeah, the lizard people of shadow the government of the Elder Scrolls. <laughs> I mean, the idea that they're vampiric is is a strong one. You can make... make With the, the Akaviri for tentates, like, yeah. still living on through the council, mm-hmm. like... Well, you know, and and then like whether swapping. there's a connection there, but also the Vampirum Order, mm. you can them having yeah. their. It, it's very heavily implied that they have their foot in the politics of the empire. It's, it's funny too because people talk about how civilized and well spoken the Imperials are, that they point to the vampires and mm. even say even the vampires act you know regal and mm. and and civil and you know they have some charm mm-hmm. yeah. compared to like Volkahar who similar to the Nords are probably a bit more. Um, violently inclined in their culture and the way savage. they deal with things. Yeah, yeah, more savage. Lurking under the ice and all that. Well, well. in addition to, um, obviously, there's like the Arcane University and their sort of big spread. There's a lot of like academic or, mm-hmm. or sort of studied magical institutions. And we have like the Battle Spire, which is essentially like a satellite spaceship out in the void of oblivion where they train Imperial battle mages and so on. Um, and I like the Imperial battle mage thing because that's kind of a tradition that started from like the Nibbanese ages ago and it's sort of continued on. Um, but they do integrate and use uh, magic in their armies and so on. It's interesting if you wanted like a good uh, a book to read about the application of that is the uh, Disaster at Ioneth, the basically the tale of Uriel V's failed Akaviri mm-hmm. invasion. But, you know, you, you hear at the battle majors like communing between ships and stuff and then they're like change, you know, fighting weather and stuff like that. Um, they're, they're an important part of um, the Legion's military. And especially when you have to consider you're fighting other magical... Um, 
races and so on when you're trying to col- you know conquer all of the empire so you've got to have you know a diverse sort of set of tools to fight them they've even had during the time of um i think it was the time of Reman, yeah during the Reman um dynasty there's the imperial man of Norts, and there's a lot oh, yeah. there's a lot of outside <laughs> stuff but they are mentioned in the canon in that they basically they traveled to Aetherius and they could get like raw kind of material and so on but outside of that is hardly any mention but there is the whole like um it's probably i'm sure it's michael kirk right it's like but yeah like, like colon colonize the moon yeah trying to colon plan yeah colonize the moon some of them are interesting I, I like it i think it's a cool kind of thing but but it's a cool expansion on it's not that out of character especially like going off like the battle spire which is a very canon kind of thing which you know and also just what the imperials do right yeah. like they they colonize they gotta conquer the they moon colonize, <laughs> they got the, the yeah. moons is the next frontier then you get Starfield. There's also a mention of the the university um, of the Gu- of Guilum, 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 whatever one. Guilum, Gu- yeah. Guil- Guilum would be better, I think. Yeah. Anyway, that um, basically it's just the source for a lot of books. Um, there's a lot of. I'm pretty sure it's a lot of different universal, like you know, like any university. There's lots of different topics and stuff to to go to. But nobody knows where it is. Yeah. It's a secret university that's never been seen. But I guess the point there to talk about is that, to, to, to hone in on, is that the Empire has brought a very high civilization state, so there's lots of uh, surplus income, lots of education and stuff that can be spent, lots of luxuries and so on. Um, and that's one of the big benefits that I'm sure everyone enjoys for it. And like they, you know, how Slalu as, the, as a chief example that we've seen in game, very much enjoy the luxuries and, and benefits that come with... Uh, you know, sacrificing your um, integrity for for some coin and some sweet gigs, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, um, we, there's also religion to talk about, but we've kind of talked about that. Actually, one thing I do want to mention, we've talked about the Imperial Divines and I think people understand them quite well. There's not, not too hard to understand. It's the integration of, of um, Nord and Eld Mary made by Alicia put into one and the Imperial Cult worships them. But Adding in uh, the whole Talos Tiber Septum thing, it's funny with like that the Skyrim Nords of the Fourth Era have become so imperialized that their whole civil war is based around an imperial god. Like their concept mm-hmm. of imperial god. Like yes, they had their like Talos, they worshipped his Izmir and so on, kind of. But it's not it's not the same. Like Talos is an imperial god. I'm pretty sure Talos even is is a is a thing from Greek mythology. I'm pretty sure it's it is the automaton. Um, Talos mythology. Sorry, I'm pretty sure it's a the, giant. It's a giant bronze man. Yeah, built built by Hephaestus, a Greek god, and so on. And it yeah goes around the island of Crete, protecting from invaders. So you got Talos, you know, who used the Numidium, a giant bronze golem, to yeah, to, yeah. to level Somerset Isle. But yeah, um, but yeah. Anyway, uh, it's just interesting that it, it's just a very imperial issue and thing. You know what I mean? Like it's not. A, Mm-hmm. Um, it's interesting too that they have a lot of apotheosis in terms of their their gods and stuff i'd mm. say compared to like some other cultures like obviously you've got talos but you also have reman and you know um mora house well i guess mora house is a bit different but yeah they they have their they have it, their man it depends like, yeah that's, that's for sure which i dep- mean plays into their their rub butting heads with the with the high elves as well and I mean, that that's probably the most important thing about their religion to talk about is it's quite easy to talk about the Nine Divines as a lot of cultures that have been imperialized do, but heavily implying that Akatosh, you know, Akatosh being the one and removing Auriel's aspects out of it as, as the Elysian Order do under Maruk is very important to imperial identity, I'd say. That, you know, it, you almost, it almost is kind of a reclamation of Shaw if you boil it down, um, or Lorcan, as opposed to Akatosh or Oriel. Yeah. If you know what I mean? Yeah. It, it's like, kind of like, <clears throat> you're going, actually, funnily enough, it's a bit hypocritical from the High Elves, because so many of their Elves were, like, mortals. Like, Apotheosis is a big part of their religion. Like, even yeah. Oriel, like, sort of more, send it back to Aetherius, and then you've got, like, Finaster and Sirvain and all of that kind of stuff. It's kind of like, oh, elves can become gods, but not men. That's that's crazy. Mm-hmm. No way. Which, to be fair, Talos, like, the whole, like, you know, many had a Talos thing and the Arcturian heresy, like, you know, he is kind of illegitimate. But, I mean, he's a real force. Talos is a real force, yeah. so a real god. They just don't like him. Which is fine, but you know. 
Mm. Um, but yeah, I guess uh, that's kind of so. The only other this is one little random anecdote that I do like. But the Thon family, the whole like Ab- ESO added with the whole Abner Thon thing. I like the idea of him being like. Um, in Shaden Hall, and he has this big family, and he's lived like many years using his magic. It's sort of like Imperial Battle Mage kind of archetype, um, and so on. And probably there could be some connection to Jagarthan. It's not 100%. Mm. I'm sure it probably is supposed to be. But also, he had like an ancestor, some Tharn ancestor from Aelid times, who was like a scribe to an Aelid king or something. What, what's the deal with Imperials and worshipping Daedra? Because obviously, uh, in the third era, um, it wouldn't be very acceptable, particularly after the Oblivion Crisis. And I know there's books that talk about Daedra worship as being hunted down in Morrowind. Um, but there was in Tiber Septim's Empire, um, the Daedric princes being referred to as the 16 acceptable blasphemies. Yeah. Which is from the Pocket Guide to the Empire first edition slash invocation. And that's the one that has the eight invocations, which, you know, is the eight divines. And then the 16 acceptable blasphemies, which are written backwards. <laughs> but, you know, it's, you know, it's almost like invoking them was an acceptable thing, but also a blasphemy mm. at the same time. Whereas later, the Imperials understandably became far more against uh, Daedra worship and anything involving them. Yeah, it's weird. I feel like it, a lot of it would maybe maybe change like on the individual level like so for example like like if it's 16 acceptable blasphemies maybe that's like the more official maybe legal stances or something but then you have like you probably have that like, imperial cult i mean in more re- recent days you have like you know the the vigilance of stendar group like hunting down data worshippers so it's probably a very different scenario but i would maybe say part of the reason for this is once again like trying to um more friendly conquer other places like well once they rule over their people like you know you've got the daedra worship amongst the dunmer and so on but even if you look it's kind of retroactively now but like we know the khajiit have had like daedric sort of stuff um worship and so on in there but another thing to consider too is look at um the malakath for example worship among the orcs and so on and it's been said before i guess we could talk tiniest mentioned about the imperial legion more but um one of the parts of of imperial success has been incorporating the strengths of other groups and people and stuff into their own so for example like orc smiths and heavy frontline troopers um are said to have been quite renowned in their armies and so on so you can imagine like allowing them and not like oh condemning them straight away because they worship malakath or something like that you know what i mean Mm -hmm. i mean that's the thing as much as they are cosmopolitan for their own advantage you can definitely see how some cultures or some people in some cultures could perceive what they're doing as quite kind and understanding when compared to other empires and, and you know, provinces. Mm. Like, out of all the different races and stuff, they are probably the most understanding or cosmopolitan. Like you're saying, mm. like, perhaps another, like, the Old Miri Dominion would just reject orcs a lot of Com- in, yeah. entirely whereas the empire tries to incorporate them. a lot of the time not I, to say they don't do bad things but. i think a lot of the time it's probably the more like extreme virtues or or, or like cultural kind of things on either side that are really going to rub against like even if you look at like from from a how slalu is like um uh, there's lots of corruption and like backhanded stuff but outside of that just in sort of principle working with the empire or something like that isn't necessarily like a bad thing it's like brings time peace and prosperity and you speak to duke vadim german it's a very forward looking thing or if you look to a lot of the other there's a lot of benefits for for your everyday average citizen in uh, under the empire probably ha- is is well off though funnily enough though i mean in morrowind um the tribunal temple has a mad focus on charity and uplifting the poor and helping the poor and so on and which is something that's not shown by the imperial cult something like that a lot of that imperial- it's interesting so i was gonna say it's interesting that goes against though what the dark elves are. it depends if you believe in like you know destiny and the gods and things like that but the dark elves are kind of supposed to learn and evolve through experiencing adversity but so remember that in the same way that the tribunal gives them prosperity and you can say interactions with Hlalu and the empire bring prosperity it's like it gets very subjective of like what is because the whole best for them yeah well the whole sigic endeavor stuff doesn't really come into play of like the mind of the dunra at large under the tribunal like really because they're yeah. so discount they're all about just their tribunal gods yeah, and they've and kind of done so, away yeah, exactly. with the the old yeah. school beliefs of the old gods look i mean arguably it's a hot look as much as it's like yeah the, you know the dunra need to learn you know 
uh, you know, to deal with the toughness of society, all that kind of stuff. I'm like, look, I'm going to ask the thousands of Dunmer buried under piles of ash after Red Mountain. I'm, like, I'm pretty sure they preferred their gods that looked after them and like, and they're yeah, definitely. But yeah, it's mm. uh, they're just participating in society. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 But yeah, I mean, it is a big deal for the Imperials to allow Daedric shrines to just be out there in the open. You know, if you look at Skyrim. The major ones are all very isolated. They're not. They're not the kind of thing that the the common person is going to stumble across, even if you can, you can see can, it in the distance. <laughs> yeah, you can see it. Mm. Like, Another, they well, are, to add, to if you imagine the scale, maybe. Yeah. But yeah, um, I mean, yeah, you you can still see. I I think it's like I mean, it's a toler it's toleration of it, not um, not. I know it says acceptable blasphemy. It's a different time, but remember, even during the Reachman um, rule, the Longhouse Emperors, when they tried to introduce um, the idea of having Daedra worship legalized and across all of the Empire, that was a big no-no, and that was like the last straw which turned them all against the the last one, Morica. Um, but uh, Morica or Leovic? Oh, it's one of them. Whatever. Which one of one came first, Morica or Leovic? I think it might even mean Leovic. But um, another thing too, just to throw there about like even your experience in Oblivion, but like. Azura, for example, you hear by Azura, 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 like reference to Azura yeah. a lot more, like from just any elf, really. Like it's not necessarily, you know what I mean? So it's like, if you're so casually referencing some Daedra, like obviously some Daedra aren't as problematic for them or something like that, or it's a rev it's acceptable to say it in your everyday conversation. So it's not like a, you know, panic and run. And like clearly there are some Daedra that are more acceptable. Like you wouldn't, as an empire, wouldn't necessarily go, Oh, her scene. If there's a bunch of hunters that worship her scene and want to hunt things, it's not really a problem. Or like, you know, um, but there are some that obviously are. I, I would almost say that from a gameplay perspective, the reason there's that acceptable blasphemies or something like that. But I feel like some of them would be unacceptable. Like Mo, like Bal, Mafala, like Mayrin's Dagon, you know, some of these things. But, mm. you know. I think as well, it kind of depends once an action is actually committed. Hmm. So just because you can pray to a god, if the god tells you to murder something, murder is still illegal in the empire. So if you follow that, you know, the empire will come down on you. Hmm. It just depends what you're doing. And I suppose if you had a group of cultists who are all, you know, you know that they murder people, then by default, they kind of become a an illegal group, like a, a gang. Yeah. Like criminals, I know it sounds funny with the connotations of calling them a criminal gang. Yeah. But if they're a group of cultists who murder people, then yeah, the it's more so have a problem the, with that. Yeah, it's more so the crime, not the, not the worship. Know, it's just that the worship will lead to the yeah. crime with certain Daedric prints. You don't get indicted for your belief necessarily. Like it's not until that belief turns into an. And action. it depends when. Depends when we're talking. I think later you can. Yeah, you would get I would say if, if we're going to talk about the Empire now in the fourth era, I'd say, yeah, especially with the vigilance yeah, 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 of Stendhal yeah, yeah. going around because, yeah, um, very... I mean, Oblivion it, Crisis changed that forever, it, for sure. Even in Oblivion, the, um, the Mythic Dawn cultists were hidden, you know, in society. They didn't walk around saying, yeah. I love Mehrun's Dagon. Yeah. They may, you know, you get your Elsa God-hater types who are very obviously <laughs> mm. anti the divines, but... Yeah, there's no doubt once it gets a little conspiratorial and they start planning things, the Empire would crack down on it. It, it yeah. wouldn't be quite so acceptable. Yeah. Yeah, but um, I, I feel like in, in reality or what they could do is that the Empire is far more complex and varied than, than we see then we do see or what i feel like oblivion kind of did really you know put a nail in the coffin in some regards and now you're working with the expansion from that but like even in that like you know there's existence of like nobility and so on but you have like the you know um dukes and kings that are imperial like you know even the king of morrowind and the dukes of morrowind and so on are imperial titles applied to other places but also you know uh there's the counts of each different city in oblivion but historically there's been like a duke of coral or, or this or like the the roles have varied and so on just like i guess like re real life you know that's how it how works too but um you, i would just i would just keep in your head in terms of the law the empire is far more expansive diverse and complicated than than you'll ever see in the in mm -hmm. the game itself and i mean one aspect of 
the Empire that is quite well done in Oblivion that shows some of their more ancient roots is the Cult of the Ancestor Moth, which has mm. kind of been around since, you know, early Nibbanese culture that has persisted to this point because it's kind of like their way of communing with with forces beyond and they were given the exclusive ability to read the Elder Scrolls, which is which Actually, has become an essential part of their culture. There's one more thing that reminds me of one more thing that I guess that we can talk about too is that obviously the Empire, like they're like, you know, the central power and everything. Um, they have been, um, in Morrowind's example, they control the exports of ebony and Dwe- um, and uh, Dwemer artifacts and so on. And they've concentrated because they want ownership of all. Same thing with the Elder Scrolls, that they've been collecting a library full of Elder Scrolls and they try and consolidate and collect all powerful artifacts and things. And, and they do really try and, you know, regulate their, uh, their uh, you know, the world's control of different artifacts and so on it's very like <laughs> british museum yeah i was just gonna say, say yeah yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah a bit like that but um yeah mm. imperials all right yeah all right well social media links are down in the description <laughs> if you want to follow us on twitter and we all look forward to nerding out with you again very soon